Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. I'd like to send a big thank you to Grim Reaper, Caden Brower, and Christina Bellas Fojon for recently joining the Curator's Disciples. Your viewership is so very much appreciated. If my disciples have any types of stories they would like told, please reach out to me in the comments and I would be most happy to oblige. In the meantime, let's get to the main event. Story number one, The Milking Room by the Curator. I guess I should start by telling you a bit about myself and Sarah. We met back in high school. She was a couple years younger than me, this shy little artist girl always doodling in her notebook during class. I was the rough and tumble type, getting into my fair share of trouble. But there was just something about Sarah that grabbed my heart right away. Maybe it was those big eyes of hers, always looking at the world with such wonder and imagination. Or her quirky sense of humor that could have me doubled over laughing one minute, then pondering the meaning of life the next. Whatever it was, I was a goner from the moment we started talking in English lit. We made it through some hard times together, after graduating, bouncing between crummy apartments and dead-end jobs just to scrape by. But we always had each other, and that's what kept us going through the rough patches. Sarah's warm spirit and creativity balanced out my cynical, hot-headed nature. We were two pieces of the same puzzle in a weird way. Then her health took a turn for the worse, right after our wedding. What was supposed to be the happiest days of our lives got derailed hard by a rare autoimmune disorder the doctors struggled to even diagnose at first. Turns out Sarah's body couldn't process toxins properly, and they just kept building up in her system, making her weaker and weaker. That's when they told us the only solution was regular blood transfusions to help flush those toxins out. It was either that or let them accumulate to deadly levels. So we adjusted to the new normal. Sarah getting hooked up to an IV every couple months for a nice top off, as she liked to call it. For a few years there, it was like we could breathe again. The transfusion schedule seemed to be working wonders. Sarah slowly regained her energy, her warm smile, that vibrant spirit that I'd fallen for in the first place. She was able to pick her art back up, taking classes at the community college and really honing her talents. I'd come home some nights and just listen to her humming as she worked on her latest painting like the weight of the world had finally lifted from those slim shoulders. Then COVID hit, followed by the nationwide shortage of donor blood, and our stable routine came crashing down. Suddenly, the transfusions keeping Sarah alive were being prioritized for emergency situations only. No amount of begging from me would change the hospital's mind. Her name just kept sliding farther and farther down that triage list. I watched in horror as she started deteriorating rapidly again without the transfusions. The color drained from her face, her body growing weaker and more frail with each passing week as the toxin levels crept upwards. Sarah's beautiful artwork languished unfinished as she spent most days lying in bed, too exhausted and drained of life to even pick up a brush. That's when the desperation truly set in for me. I swore on everything I held sacred that I would find Sarah a steady supply of transfusion blood, by whatever means necessary. Going through official medical channels was a no-go, but maybe the seedy underground markets of the dark web could provide a back-alley solution. Those first few shady websites I found were obvious scam operations. Little more than a virtual hand waiting to snatch cash from desperate people like me. But then my buddy Mike put me into contact with the guy running the milking room operation and everything changed. Sure, their website looked like a crime against graphic design 
with creepy occult symbols and distorted images everywhere. But the ordering process was legit. You could select blood types and quantities just like buying anything else online. And they delivered the literal life-saving goods shipped in legitimate medical cooling containers. For months, I was able to put aside any deeper thoughts about where the milking room was sourcing all this human blood from. Their headers mentioned something about being missionaries of the Red Rebirth who provided sacred vitae for healing and transcendence. But I just wrote that off as more edgy occult marketing bullshit to cater to the weird fringes of society. What did make me start questioning things, though, were the volume statistics they provided on the order pages. Like, there's an info box that shows how many individual donors were required to supply something like 10 liters of B positive. And the numbers were... Off, to say the least. We're talking 30, 40, sometimes upwards of 60 different donors being listed for a single bulk shipment's worth of blood. Math was never my strong suit. But even I knew those figures couldn't be adding up if we were talking about normal blood bank donations from volunteers. Those places strictly limit how much can be taken from one person over a certain time frame. Still, my mind was in straight-up denial mode. I just lied to myself, convincing myself that maybe the milking room had access to special medical provisions that allowed them to draw higher quantities per donor or something. Anything to avoid facing the sinking suspicion that this blood was coming from a much darker place. Then I got that bombshell video from the anonymous sender and everything became impossible to keep ignoring. That leaked footage was like getting a front row seat to an actual waking nightmare. It opened on what looked like an abandoned hospital or research lab, dimly lit in eerie night vision tones of green and black. Row after row of gurneys and IV stands filled the room with over a dozen unconscious people. Men and women of all ages strapped down onto them. Some had tubes and needles already inserted into their bodies, hooked up to make shift machines for God knows what sinister purpose. The camera operator moved in for some tight, horrifying close-ups at that point. I can still see that poor young woman's face burned into my mind, her eyes closed and mouth slightly open like she was just taking an afternoon nap. If not for the thick catheter line snaking out of her arm and hooked up to a tangle of tubes and hanging blood pouches, you might have thought she was merely resting between hospital visits. Whoever was filming stood there for an agonizing minute, mere inches away from her helpless form, just silently documenting every angle of her body being prepped like a piece of medical machinery. As the footage went on, Robed figures straight out of a slasher movie started entering the frame, their faces obscured by ominous masks and hoods. These clearly weren't doctors or medical personnel. They moved quickly and with a disturbing sense of routine. Opening valves, adjusting IV lines, swapping out those nefarious blood collection pouches dangling beside each patient. One of the cultists took something resembling a portable drill at one point and started punching fresh catheter lines into the prone victims' bodies with horrifying mechanical precision. No consent, no anesthesia. Just treating them like trees being tapped for sap. That's when I had to turn it off. My stomach practically inside out from revulsion. So that's where I'm at now still ordering my regular shipments from the milking room, trying to put that nightmarish footage out of my head and return to a state of willful ignorance. Anything to keep Sarah's life sustaining supply of stolen blood flowing ever onwards, without interruption. At the same time, I'm not an idiot. I know there's a damn good chance that the very people behind this operation had that gruesome video leaked to me as a warning to keep my trap shut and my money flowing their way. 
Why else leave such a sadistic calling card lying around for a client to potentially stumble across? Either they suspect I'm onto their twisted milking operation and were flexing their power over me, or I simply got a glimpse behind the curtain that very few people were ever supposed to witness. In which case, I've probably dug myself into an incredibly dangerous position by now. They say, knowledge is power. But in this case, I fear it's put me at the complete mercy of some seriously deranged and brutal individuals. Part of me knows I should scrape together what little integrity I have left and take everything I've seen to the authorities. Burn this whole sickening operation to the ground once and for all, no matter what personal cost I'll suffer from being an accessory to their crimes. It's the right thing to do. The only thing a good man with a conscience would do. But then I look over at Sarah, peaceful in our bed, with the warm morning sunlight draping over her delicate features. Her cheeks have a healthy rose color to them again after her latest treatment. Our little apartment is littered with her reignited artistic passions, half-finished canvases, splattered palettes, fresh sketches pinned up on the walls. Physical reminders that this routine has allowed the vibrant spark inside my wife to burn bright once more, pulling her back from the brink of that waking death she was trapped in before. So, yeah, I can't really put Sarah through that hell again of slowly withering away. Like... She was pretty much a ghost of herself for a while there before I found the milking room supply. Just laying in bed all day, too tired and drained to even make it to the bathroom sometimes. Her skin got this awful grayish pallor, her beautiful eyes sunken back in their sockets. She looked like death warmed over man. Seeing her that way, feeling so helpless to stop her slipping away, it damn near broke me. There were times I'd have to leave the room before she saw me crying like a little bitch because I couldn't stand the sight of her suffering like that. And the guilt I felt over not being able to provide the one thing keeping her alive, the transfusions, it ate me up inside every single day. That's why, as fucked up as this whole milking room thing is, I can't just quit it cold turkey now. Not when Sarah's finally gotten her life and her strength back these past several months. She started putting on a bit of healthy weight again. Her cheeks have filled back out nice. She'll even get these rosy spots in them when she's been exerting herself on her feet for a while, like an inner radiance shining through. And don't get me started on her art. Sarah's just been in this crazy creative flow lately churning out new paintings and sketches like a woman possessed. Vibrant landscapes, moody photorealistic portraits, even some darker, more abstract pieces I can't quite wrap my head around. But they're all undeniably her. Those bold strokes and fearless use of color that I fell for way back in high school. She started taking an online art class for the first time in ages, joining these Zoom meetings with her laptop propped up on her little mobile easel. I'll sit and listen in sometimes while she chimes in with her thoughts and analysis. The passion and spark in her voice is just a beautiful thing to behold. Like she's finally been unchained from that prison of sickness and fatigue. In the evenings, Sarah and I will make a simple dinner together, maybe watch a funny movie or two curled up on the couch. Just taking pleasure in the simple, quiet domesticity we were robbed of for so long while she was sick. Some nights, she'll get antsy and want to go out, so we'll toss on some fresh clothes and hit up a local bar for drinks and live music. Holding her close on the little dance floor, breathing in the familiar lavender shampoo scent of her hair. For a little while in those moments, everything feels okay. Feels right and worth fighting for. That's what I keep reminding myself of whenever new orders come in from the milking room and my conscience starts eating away at me 
that I'm doing this to preserve the small shreds of a normal existence we've pieced back together for Sarah. To keep that light still flickering behind her eyes instead of watching it get cruelly snuffed out again. Do I feel like a vile, disgusting excuse for a human piece of garbage most days? You're damn right, I do. Knowing that the treatments allowing my wife to go on living likely come from those poor, faceless souls getting endlessly drained against their will. It's a thought that hasn't stopped making me dry heave since I watched that video. But at the same time, I was given an impossible choice that no man should ever have to make. And I knew which road I had to take, no matter how dark the destination might lead. Because in my mind, there are no alternatives left that wouldn't destroy Sarah in the most permanent of ways. Still, I'm definitely being careful not to draw any extra heat or attention now that I know the sick truth behind the milking room. I've got the orders being discreetly shipped to a rented mailbox across town instead of our home address. Any payments are made through those concentrated methods of virtual currency and encrypted communications to cover my tracks. Part of me wonders if the sickos running this operation already suspect I'm onto them, though. Like, was that anonymously leaked video some sort of terrifying warning shot for me to keep my mouth shut and my money flowing their way? Or did I simply stumble across something I was never meant to bear witness to in the first place? Either way, now that I've been exposed to the nightmarish core of their business, I've likely painted a huge target on my own back. These aren't the type of people to let loose ends dangle, if you know what I'm saying. So who knows how much longer I'll be allowed to keep up this uneasy routine of plausible deniability. Sometimes, late at night, I'll jolt awake in a cold sweat from dreaming about those robed figures discovering my knowledge of their bloody operation. They came for me silently, slipping into the darkness like smoke given form, and pried me away from Sarah's warm embrace in our bed. No struggle, no explanations. I was simply taken to be metabolized into their farm of faceless, perpetual donors. Other nights, it's Sarah I see lying comatose and ravaged on one of those gurneys, wasting away to skeletal remains while those masked figures calmly harvested her for the next payout. Even worse are the visions of her wailing in unbearable anguish, betrayed and destroyed by the lengths I've gone to in sacrificing every last shred of my morality to keep her intact. Happy fucking endings are in pretty short supply for us these days. Just an endless tunnel where every flicker of warm light gets snuffed out by the grim darkness lurking ahead. I'm not gonna lie, on my darkest days, the thought of putting a quick premature end to this whole sickening cycle has started to creep in at the edges of my mind. Because what's the alternative, really? Let Sarah get drained down to nothing, just like all those poor nameless bastards in the video? or screw up my fragile arrangement with the milking room and get us both thrown into whatever dimly lit charnel pit they're shipping from. Sometimes, I wonder if it would just be a kinder fate to take myself and Sarah into those eternally dreamless depths on my own terms before whichever unspeakable horrors are awaiting. Just drift off peacefully together into that good night secure in the knowledge that we don't have to keep treading down this sickening path any longer. Ah, who am I kidding? I could never go through with anything like that. Sarah's life force burns too bright, too vibrant with the simple joys of being alive in this world. As rotten and hopeless as my own souls become, hers still shines with this pure creative passion that I've pledged to help protect and preserve at any cost. For her sake, I'll keep grinding forward until my supply chain finally gets severed.
and there are no rat hole suppliers left to turn to. Then, then I don't know what I'll do. But until that day comes, you can be damn sure I'm going to wring every last drop of comfort and normalcy out of this for Sarah that I possibly can. I just ask that you keep our tale to yourselves and maybe say a prayer on our behalf. Because God knows we've already been dragged through the worst hell imaginable and come out permanently disfigured on the other side. All I can do now is keep powering towards the light for as long as my unholy bargain holds, before the milking room's masters decide to snuff me out for good. Story number two. Confessions of an Organ Harvester. I can still remember the day it all started. It's burned into my brain, like a scar that never really fades. I was just a kid then, maybe around 10 years old. My name is Adam, and I grew up in a small, quiet town in the Midwest. You know, the kind of place where everyone knows everyone and nothing bad ever happens. Or at least, that's what people thought. My parents were decent folks. Dad worked long hours at a factory, and Mom was a schoolteacher. We lived in a modest house with a big yard where I spent most of my free time playing. I guess I had a pretty normal childhood until the day everything changed. It was a Saturday afternoon. I had been playing in the yard, kicking around a soccer ball by myself because none of my friends could come over. I remember hearing a van pull up and thinking it was weird because we didn't get many visitors. I didn't think much of it at first. A man stepped out of the van and waved at me. He looked friendly enough, smiling as he walked over. Hey there, buddy, he said. I'm looking for your dad. Can you help me find him? Being the Navy kid I was, I didn't think twice. I told him dad was inside and he asked if I could show him. The next thing I knew, he had grabbed me, and everything went dark. When I woke up, I was in the back of the van, tied up and gagged. Panic set in immediately. My heart pounded, and I struggled against the ropes, but it was no use. I didn't know where I was, or who had taken me. All I could think about was getting back home. The van drove for what felt like hours, Eventually, it stopped, and I was dragged out into a dimly lit room. It smelled like bleach and metal. I was thrown into a small, dingy cell with a cot and a bucket in the corner. There was nothing else. Days turned into weeks. I lost track of time. They fed me just enough to keep me alive. Occasionally, the man who took me would come in and talk to me. He never told me his name and I never dared to ask. We're going to teach you some skills, he'd say. Skills that will make you useful. I didn't understand at first. I was just a kid. But soon, the lessons began. They brought in an old man to teach me. His name was Dr. Wilson. He looked tired and worn out, like he had seen too much in his life. He wasn't cruel. But he wasn't kind either. He was just there. Pay attention, boy, he'd say. This knowledge will keep you alive. The first lesson was anatomy. I was forced to learn everything about the human body. Every bone, every organ, every vein. At first, it was just pictures and diagrams. Then, it became real. They started with animals. Dr. Wilson would bring in a dog or a cat, and I had to dissect it. I hated it. I cried every time, but crying didn't change anything. Dr. Wilson was patient but firm. Emotions will get you killed, he'd say. You need to detach yourself. I tried to shut down my feelings, to turn off the part of my brain that told me this was wrong. It took a long time, but eventually, I became numb. The animals stopped bothering me, and that's when they brought in the humans. The first time I was forced to work on a human, I vomited. 
It was a young man, probably in his twenties. I didn't know who he was, or why he was there. Dr. Wilson guided me through the process, step by step. Precision is key, he said. One wrong move, and the organ is useless. I learned how to remove organs, how to preserve them, and how to package them for delivery. It was gruesome, but I didn't have a choice. This was my life now. The organs were sold on the dark web. I didn't know much about it at first. Dr. Wilson handled all the transactions. He showed me how to log in, how to navigate the sites, and how to communicate with buyers. It was a hidden world, full of people looking for things that shouldn't be for sale. Years passed. I became proficient at my job. I didn't think about my family anymore. They were a distant memory, like a dream I once had. The man who took me was still around, but I saw less of him. Dr. Wilson became my only companion. He was a strange man. Sometimes he'd talk about his past, about how he used to be a respected surgeon before he fell into this dark world. I never asked how or why. It didn't matter. We moved around a lot never staying in one place for too long. I think they were afraid of being caught. But as long as I did my job, I was treated well. I had food, a place to sleep, and sometimes even a book to read. It wasn't much, but it was enough. There were perks to my job, if you can call them that. I was good at what I did, and that gave me a sense of purpose. I wasn't just some scared kid anymore. I was valuable. But there were downsides too. I never had a normal life. I never went to school, never made friends, never fell in love. My world was small, confined to the places we stayed and the people we operated on. I learned to cope by detaching myself. Emotions were dangerous. They made you weak. I couldn't afford to be weak. Not in this world. One day, everything changed again. It was a routine operation. Or at least, that's what I thought. The man at the table looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. He was unconscious, prepped for surgery. I went through the motions, just like I always did. But as I made the first incision, something clicked. The man's face. It was older, worn, but there was something about it. I stopped, my hands shaking. Keep going, Dr. Wilson said, but his voice sounded distant. I looked closer. The man's features, they were a mirror of my own. A scar above his left eyebrow, just like the one Dad had from a childhood accident. My heart pounded in my chest, and for the first time in years, I felt something. Panic. Fear. Anguish. Dad, I whispered, but he didn't respond. I stumbled back, the surgical tools clattering to the floor. Dr. Wilson looked at me, confusion turning to anger. What's wrong with you? He shouted, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I just stared at the man on the table, the man who might be my father. That night, I made a decision. I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't live this life. If that man was my father, I had to find out. And if he wasn't, I still had to get away. I couldn't spend another day harvesting organs for strangers. I waited until everyone was asleep. Dr. Wilson's snores echoed through the house. I crept into the operating room and looked at the man on the table. He was still unconscious, but his breathing was steady. I'm sorry, I whispered. I'm so sorry. I gathered my things, a few clothes, some money I had stashed away, and a small knife. It wasn't much, but it was enough. I slipped out of the house and into the night. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have a plan, but I knew I had to get as far away as possible. The city lights flickered in the distance, a beacon of hope in the darkness. It's been a few months since I escaped. 
I'm still on the run, always looking over my shoulder, always afraid of being caught. I've managed to find work here and there, odd jobs that don't ask too many questions. I haven't found my father. I don't even know if it was really him, but I have to believe he's out there somewhere. I have to believe there's a chance for a better life. I still have nightmares. I see the faces of the people I operated on, their eyes staring at me, accusing me. But I try to push it all away. I have to keep moving forward. One day, I'll find my family. One day, I'll be free. Until then, I have to survive. And that's my story. It's not a happy one, but it's mine. If you're out there, Dad, I'm sorry for everything. I hope you're safe. I hope you're looking for me too. I finish my story, and for a moment, there's silence in the room. The patient on the table is unconscious, unaware of the tale I've just told. I take a deep breath and look at the man across from me. The man who kidnapped me all those years ago. He's older now, his face lined with age and stress. You did well, he says, his voice gruff. You always do. I nod, my hands steady as I begin the operation. The organ must be removed carefully, precisely. There's no room for error. The operating room is dimly lit. The harsh, fluorescent lights casting an eerie glow over the sterile instruments laid out on the tray. I pull on my surgical gloves feeling the familiar snap against my wrists. The patient's chest rises and falls rhythmically, the only sign of life in an otherwise silent room. First, I make a clean horizontal incision just below the rib cage. The scalpel glides smoothly through the skin, guided by years of practice. Blood wells up along the cut, but I quickly staunch it with gauze. I've done this countless times, each movement is methodical, precise. Once the initial incision is complete, I switch to a deeper blade to cut through the layers of muscle and fat. The sound is a soft, wet slicing noise, almost like cutting through a piece of raw steak. I peel back the layers of flesh, exposing the glistening organs beneath. There's a certain detachment that comes with this job. The human body becomes just another machine, its parts interchangeable and valuable. I use a rib spreader to open the chest cavity, the metal device creaking as it forces the bones apart. The patient's heart is visible now, beating steadily. I focus on my task, pushing aside any lingering thoughts about the morality of what I'm doing. This is just another job, I tell myself. Just another day. I locate the liver first. It's a robust organ, nestled beneath the diaphragm. Carefully, I sever the connective tissues holding it in place, using a combination of scissors and scalpel. The liver is heavy and slippery, but I've done this enough times to handle it with ease. Once it's free, I place it in a sterile container, packing it with ice to preserve its viability. Next is the kidney. I make a precise incision along the side of the abdomen, carefully navigating around the intestines to reach the organ. The kidney is easier to remove, smaller and less vascular than the liver. I clamp the renal artery and vein, cutting them cleanly before extracting the kidney and placing it in another container. The final organ I need to harvest is the heart. This is the most delicate part of the operation the most crucial. I pause for a moment, steadying my hands. I carefully cut through the pericardium, the sac that encases the heart. The organ is still beating, a testament to the life force within the patient. I attach the heart-lung machine, ensuring that the patient's blood continues to circulate even after I remove the heart. With everything in place, I begin the delicate process of disconnecting the heart from the body. I sever the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, working quickly but meticulously. 
The heart is still beating as I lift it from the chest cavity, a macabre reminder of the life I'm ending. I place the heart in the final container, packing it with ice. The room is silent again, save for the soft hum of the heart-lung machine. I look down at the open chest cavity, the empty space where the heart once was. There's a strange sense of finality to it, a quiet acknowledgement of the irreversible nature of my work. I close up the incisions, suturing the flesh back together with practiced efficiency. Patient will never wake up, but that's not my concern. My job is done. As I finish, I step back and remove my gloves, tossing them into the biohazard bin. I feel a strange mix of emotions. A hollow emptiness mingled with a grim satisfaction. One day, I'll find a way out. One day, I'll be free. But for now, this is my reality. And so, I continue. Harvesting organs in the shadows. Telling my story to those who will listen. Hoping that one day, someone will hear my silent cry for help. This is the curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.